Welcome to Cafe Chat. I'm Chris Kavasik, a health educator with the Brown County Public Health Division with Brown County Health and Human Services. And I'm Meredith Hansen. I'm the resource specialist here at ADRC, Aging and Disability Resource Center of Brown County. I can't believe how nice it is outside. It's gorgeous. We're and usually we're videotaping in the morning, so this is just crazy. Sun is shining, we're right in ADRC, it's beautiful. There's a card game going on over there next to us, yeah. this is awesome. <laughs> we gotta apologize for the noise, but it's just always so busy here around ADRC that we barely find time to film, but it's a good thing. Come on down and see what's happening here, and we just have a lot of fun. Absolutely. So. Well, so welcome, and today's theme is going to be talking about the safe disposing of prescription medications and medication oh, safety. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you knew this, but on April 29th, it's a national drug take back event. They do it every cool. year, and wow. so we thought that this would be a great time to talk about how to safely dispose of medications. It's something that everybody needs to know, Chris. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're young, old, you need to know how to keep your meds safe and how to keep other people from getting to them. So, who are we going to have with us today to talk about that? Well, today we're going to have Tyler Lipke. He's an alcohol and other drug counselor from Brown County's Health and Human Services. And he's going to talk to us about how we can safely lock our medications in our homes. And the med boxes that he's going to be showing us, they can be found pretty much at any, like, um, Home Depot, Walmart, and prices vary. But, you know, we will definitely provide you with um, more information on those medication boxes at the end of the video. And the other neat thing that we have to celebrate May being Older Americans Month, and the theme is Age Out Loud, but here at ADRC, since we also work with adults with disabilities, we're calling it Act Out Loud. Uh, we've got two of our wonderful volunteer board members, Bev Bartlett and Jessica Nell, and they're going to be talking about what they do in the community to give back, to be that voice, to break that stereotype, and really show that aging and having a disability is not at all what it used to be. I mean, these two really give a lot to the community, and they also give a lot to themselves by staying active, staying healthy, doing the things they love, and just really living life. They're such an inspiration. Absolutely. I think you'll find that all of our guests today are an inspiration in and of itself. So let's get going. Let's get started. Yeah. So here we have with us Tyler Lidke. He's an AODA counselor with Brown County's Health and Human Services. And he's going to talk to us a little bit more today about safe medication disposal and how to store medications safely. So Tyler, you're an AODA counselor. Can you give us a little bit more information about what you do on a daily basis? Well, my role within uh, Brown County Health and Human Services is I'm a part-time AODA prevention specialist, so I'll call another drug, and I'm also a CCS case manager, and CCS stands for Comprehensive Community Services. So I have a caseload as well as doing prevention activities. That can range from making sure people get to uh, doctor's appointments to if they have psychiatric decompensation and need to go to the hospital, I make sure that happens as well. So it's an exciting day within uh, my day at uh, Brown County. <laughs> so every day is different. Every day is absolutely different. You're involved in a lot of different things regarding drug abuse mm -hmm. and prevention. So can you tell us why you do what you do? Uh, well, I do what I do is because I'm, I'm a person in long-term recovery myself, so um, part of my own recovery was being able to um, give back to the community and give back to those who are also in need. So if you look at any of the 12-step work or anything like that, uh, the 12-step is service. So um, I found that to be kind of the foundation of my own recovery, so giving back, and that kind of helps me stay sober in the process as well because... Yeah, I, I don't want to be doing this job if I'm still actively, you know, engaged in that type of behavior, so. So, we have this interesting contraption sitting on the table here. Can you tell us what you brought with you today? So, this is a, a sentry safe, and it is used to house uh, medications. So, in some of my past roles, I know that we had given these out for... Uh, other grants throughout the state so um, like 
keeping your medication safe for like Suboxone or any other type of home medication is what it's essentially used for. And it's very um, safe and easy to use. Uh, it's just that now, unfortunately, we live in a time where we, we really can't just keep our medications out. And it's for our own safety. It's for the public safety as well. And just by using this uh, safe and simple device, we can uh, make sure to keep people safe. Can you show us how it works? Absolutely. So, essentially, you have the key method here. So you can either lock or and then, like this is what locks it, this is what opens it. Um, it, also, it also comes with a, t a tether, so it can be tethered. Um, or you can use the process where coming up with your own keypad, you can punch that in, and all the directions are right there in front. It's very safe and simple, so no different than like a like a gun cabinet or anything like that. Excellent. So basically, uh, what you can do is you can put your medications in here, uh, put that in a safe, secure location. Make sure the keys just don't be. Keeping your keys in there, you know, out of out of reach of yeah. children or that would kind of defeat the purpose, right? <laughs> right. And make sure that it's kind of like a safeguarding your computer as well, where you don't want to have your code written on here as well. But you got to you got to say it every now and then. But that that's essentially how this system works here. Okay, excellent. That's good to know. And seeing this makes me think, you know, we're here at ADRC. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to older adults or adults with disabilities about medication safety? Is there anything pertinent to those individuals to uh, be aware of? Absolutely. Um, older adults moving out of their homes or going into assisted uh, living facilities, uh, when uh, the estate sale comes or when uh, when they are moving and showing their home, making sure to have their medications locked is safe. Okay. It, it's a good practice because uh, from my own experience and from working with people within the community that are recovering, you know, they've told many stories where, yeah, that would be a prime area for us to go is to go jumping from uh, open house to open house and just rifling through the, the medication cabinets and finding whatever they can to fix their to fix their fix, essentially. So, um, making sure that older adults are safe, younger adults are safe, the community are safe. Very important to use such devices. So. so, not only while you're living at home and having these medications, but also good for caregivers too to be aware, Absolutely. mindful of that when their loved ones are moving on. It's just as important yep. when you're traveling with these medications. Abs okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good to know. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. You. you have been very enlightening, and I think it makes me think about my own home and yes. what I need to be doing differently to not only protect the people in my house, but potentially those that can be coming into our houses. Excellent. Right. Like when I, my former position, I, I worked with uh, recovering people that would be prescribed Suboxone, so giving them a controlled drug, we'd make sure to give every single client one of these to make sure that their kids or no one else would be getting their hands on them. So sure. uh, using such safeguards is, in my opinion, best practice. Absolutely. Something so simple can be life or death. A absolutely. I look at it no difference as like a trigger guard on a handgun or a, a yeah. gun safe or anything like that. So it, it's just basically to protect ourselves and the public, yeah. so to reduce overdose and death. So. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Chris, that was so interesting, Tyler telling us about how do we keep our medications safe and locked up in our homes. but trying to figure out too what do we do if our medications expire how do we dispose of them safely you've got more on that for us right absolutely Meredith today I'm going to be going over to the Brown County Sheriff's Office and bringing in some of the medication that I took out of my medicine cabinet at home so um, I will be able to show everyone exactly how easy it is to clean those medicine cabinets out get expired medication out of the house or even a prescription that you might not have finished taking and you have a pill or two left, you can get rid of those too. So stay tuned and we will come to you from the Brown County Sheriff's Office. 
Hi there! As you can see, we are here at the Brown County Sheriff's Department located at 2684 Development Drive in Bellevue, Wisconsin. They are located off of Highway 172 on the GV exit. So what we're going to do is I have some medication here in my bag and we're going to go in and see how we can safely dispose of the medication. And for those of you who have medication that you'd like to drop off, please make sure that you do it Monday through Friday during normal business hours, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So come on, let's go inside and see what we can figure out. When arriving at the Brown County Sheriff's Office, enter through their main doors and proceed to the reception area. There, the following items are accepted. Prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, vitamins, and pet medications. There are a couple rules that you will need to follow when disposing of your medications. You will want to make sure to have your medications in clear Ziploc bags. Any medications that are in blister packages need to go in one separate Ziploc. You want to make sure to put the blister packages in the Ziploc bags without any of the directions or the containers themselves. Then you will want to put all pills into another Ziploc bag. Empty all the bottles of pills into the Ziploc bag and seal it up. You can mix prescription medications with over-the-counter medications and even if you have pet pills they can be mixed in as well. If you have liquids or creams, they should be bagged separately from the over-the-counter items and pills. Also note that inhalers are accepted but need to be in separate Ziploc bags. There are items that are not accepted at the location. Please make sure that you do not bring any needles, syringes, or lancets thermometers, aerosol cans, empty containers, personal care products such as nail polish, hairspray, deodorant, toothpaste, regular shampoo and conditioners, medical wastage, band-aids, gauze, sutures, splints, cast, cold packs, heating pads, etc. Anything that contains bodily fluids, or medication from a medical facility or veterinary clinic, such as um, Miralax or um, powdered products. By properly disposing of unused medications, we can all do our part to make Brown County a safer place to live, work, and play. Thanks for viewing today. Having a disability doesn't mean what it used to. For many, this can be a point in your life where your passions, dreams, hopes can be fulfilled or even get a fresh start. We are here today to talk about the Older Americans Month. The theme, which is Age Out Loud, here at ADRC we call it Act Out Loud, emphasizes what older adults and adults with disabilities can do in their life to bring confidence, passion, and just an overall enthusiasm for life. A good example of someone doing this in our community is one of our volunteer board members here at ADRC, Bev Bartlett. Thanks so much for joining us, Bev. Hi, Meredith. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. So tell us a little bit about your background and why we brought you here today. Well, many years ago, I started out as a teacher. And my experience includes teaching at the high school level, teaching adult education at the technical colleges and those programs brought me to Green Bay and I started developing programs at the old senior center on 342 South Webster Avenue and so I was there uh, until we moved into the new building here at the ADRC and in total spent 19 years in service to older adults. My husband and I retired to the UP uh, in 1998 he stayed retired, I went back to work. I couldn't stand it. 
So I started working for the Alzheimer's Association in Michigan. And then nine years after that, our grandchildren were born, and I said we've had a nine-year vacation, so we're moving back to Green Bay. So he reluctantly came with me, and I started with the Alzheimer's Association here. And after another nine years, I retired for the last time in 2015. And now I'm focused on being a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, and going to all the kids' soccer games and school concerts and weekend sleepovers with my grandkids. <laughs> all the fun stuff. All the fun <laughs> stuff, yes. Bev, you're so involved in the community. Can you tell us why you still continue to do as much as you do? Well, after I retired, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and I thought, well, maybe I'll turn toward children or, you know, women's issues and so forth. And lo and behold, I found that my passion was really serving older adults. So I got involved in the ADRC. I was invited to become a board member, and I've been very involved in my Schmidt Park neighborhood uh, in, and just a support group facilitator. I teach powerful tools for caregivers, uh, those kinds of things. Um, Caregiver Coalition of Brown County. And my passion then is to just work with older adults and do what I can to give back to the community. Well, you said you officially retired in 2015. So have you found any new hobbies or any passions since then in addition to everything else you're doing? <laughs> Well, I do have some fun on doing fairy gardening, miniature gardening, both indoors and outdoors. And I teach many of those classes throughout the area. I even go as far as Shano, do some homemaker work. I do the, the classes in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, uh, and schools. So fairy gardening has been a new hobby for me, and it's turned into a real enjoyable uh, part of my life. Awesome. And we enjoy having you here doing those fairy gardens and sharing that passion. When you're talking about that you're such an advocate for older adults and that is where your passion lies, what advice would you give other older adults to act out loud this month? I think in order to stay healthy, you have to stay active. And I think retirement gives you an opportunity to try things that you've never done before make some new friends. I think so often we find out in our careers that we have a, a very close-knit group of friends at work right. and many times when we retire we lose those friendships. So stay active in the community. Give back. I mean now is the time when you can pick and choose the things that are really important to you that you never had time to do. So explore what's out there get involved, stay active, but don't forget to take care of yourself in the process That's because true. health issues can change as we get older. And uh, it's fun to say, you know, this are the golden years, but if you aren't taking care of yourself, uh, your health issues could be a stumbling block. You have to be your own caregiver. That's sometimes. right. That's yeah. right. And thank you for reminding me because caregiver uh, responsibilities can also take a big part of your life. For example, if the spouse or even adult children need help with their children, mm -hmm. caregiving is a huge part of your retirement years. Very good point. And just to highlight a little bit more of what Bev does for not only the ADRC community, but Brown County community in general, back in our March issue of our magazine, we highlighted more of Bev's story, so you can find that online if you'd like to learn more about how Bev is helping in the community. But Bev, you shared this wonderful quote from a caregiver. Um, they had given you a plaque after all of your work with them through the Alzheimer's Association, and I think this quote really summarizes what this Act Out Loud theme is about for the month of May in celebrating older adults and adults with disabilities. It says, if you planted hope today in any hopeless heart, if someone's burden was lighter because you did your part, if you caused a laugh that chased away a tear, if tonight your name is mentioned when someone kneels to pray, then your day was well spent. And I think that was aptly given to you, Bev, for all of the service that you have done in our community and, like I said, for ADRC. And 
all you are such an inspiration for all of us as we go on this path of life. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. You're an inspiration. Well, <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Bev, for sharing your story with us. That's a great example of how you can act out loud in our community. And we're also going to look at another story on giving you maybe a different perspective on our community activists. That's right, Chris. I had the pleasure of being able to interview Jessica Nell, one of our ADRC board members, just like Bev. And she has just a great example of how she, like Chris said, is acting out loud in our community and making a difference. Let's travel to Jess's apartment and hear more. So, on this part of our segment, we have the pleasure of talking with Jessica Nell. She is one of our volunteer ADRC board members, and she is such a great inspiration and image for this month's Act Out Loud theme for Older Americans Month and then also celebrating adults with disabilities. So, Jessica, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Um, I've been living on my own in my apartment here for about 11 years, and my independence is very important uh, to me. I have a service animal, a dog, who I absolutely love and helps me <laughs> keep um, independent. And um, I have a bachelor's and master's degree in social work, and you know that's where my huge passion for helping comes from, is my ability to give back what's been given to me. and. It's just a huge passion of mine to help others. Well, that's wonderful. Like you mentioned that you want to give back so much that has been given to you. And uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Why do you like giving back? And what kind of advocacy work do you do to give back to our community? I like giving back because I believe personally that everybody should have a voice, no matter if they have a voice or not, if they're unable to speak for themselves due to some physical disability or they just aren't comfortable with that. Everybody needs a voice and in today's society there's a lot of changes going on that maybe aren't helping people with disabilities or older Americans and so I do a lot of social um, advocacy, political advocacy, but I also do a lot of civil rights advocacy okay. around um, people with disabilities living the most quality life that they can regardless of their disability. So, for instance, someone like me not having to live in a community-based residential facility or a nursing home, but being able to have the support to live on my own in my own apartment and direct my life how I would like to. How you would like to be. And you, you make a really good point that by being independent, you can then help others that aren't as independent or whose voice is being not, not heard in the community. Yeah, I think too often we in society group people with disabilities and older Americans as those who are frail and unable to help themselves or care for themselves. And that's really not the case. Um, people with disabilities can do almost everything that you could do. It just has to be done differently and people have to be willing to look outside the box for solutions and I find that too often that isn't the case with so many people, uh, um, companies, employers, organizations, you know, we want to group people quickly into what we see them as. Okay, Jessica's yes. in a wheelchair, she must not be able to do X, Y, and Z when really I'm just as smart if not smarter than a lot of my um, fellow people around me. Who aren't in a wheelchair. Yeah, who aren't yes. in a wheelchair. Yes. Um, with that in mind, you're talking about employers. You just started a new job, and it's a great example of how independent you can be, that you're out in the workforce and doing things, and, and with your degree. Tell us a little bit more about that. I did just... Um, get a new job. I just actually started today. Um, Congratulations. I'm working um, actually out of my apartment as a virtual, it's called a virtual receptionist for a answering service. So not necessarily in my field, but I'm hoping getting some employment experience will certainly help me um, get my foot in the door with other opportunities. And I certainly want to continue all the advocacy work and volunteer work I do. So it still allows me to do that kind of stuff. Wonderful. And 
with this theme of act out loud, and you've already hinted to it with old, uh, adults with disabilities and how can they be advocates in the community, how can those individuals let their voices be heard and help other people let their voices be heard, just like what you're doing? I often hear people tell me, oh, I could never do what you do. I could never go to Madison and talk to legislators or go to Washington, D.C. and speak on Capitol Hill or um, even call legislators or meet them for coffee. But the key to that is it doesn't have to be that big. A simple email, a simple voicemail, a um, standing in a demonstration. You don't even have to physically use your voice and speak out. Just those little things, that's advocacy, that's making a difference. Or not even with um, public figures, you know, telling your caregivers what you want and what you need using oh, your own voice. Um, you, your doctors, everyday people, just um, being you and telling people what you need. I think when people think advocacy, they think, oh, I could never do those big things. Yeah, that's what I do because I'm comfortable with it and I've grown to enjoy it and it's something I've become good at, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to be that big, booming voice. Right. All it takes is just one voice, and Jessica is such an amazing example of how starting small and then getting bigger with your advocacy work is just making a huge difference in our community. So thank you for talking with us today, and thank you for all the work that you do to act out loud in our community. Thank you. You're welcome. We want to thank all of our guests today, Tyler mentioning the medication safety and our ADRC board members, Bev and Jess, who really exemplified what it means to make a difference in our community, continue to act out loud, and just show that no matter what age, you can make a difference and you can do things that you enjoy and share that passion with others. So we've got some more great episodes coming up. Chris? Stay tuned next month. We're going to be talking about what you need to know in a restaurant inspection and making it safe, which sounds kind of scary, but it's really exciting. You're going to get a sneak peek at ADRC's Grounded Cafe soon to open. And we're also going to hear from our dietitian here at ADRC talking about how you can eat healthy at a restaurant throughout the summer. So. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for our next episode. And like always, we welcome feedback, comments. If there's something that you want to know about that's going on in our community, follow us on Facebook and let us know your thoughts. Check Thanks us so out much. on YouTube. We'll see you next time on Cafe Chats.